All right, live from Austin, Texas, it's Human Factors Chaos. Today is October 9th, 2017. Yes, we are in Austin, Texas, and you are listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 61. I'm live from HFES. We're going to break down all the stories this week. So we're going to talk a lot about all those Google devices, how Intel is changing the Internet of Things, uh, smart band-aids, and how some 80s classics, you know me, and Star Wars influenced UI design. Tell your HoloLens chatbot to bring up Human Factors Cast because the show starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, what is up, guys? Nick, it is so good to hear from you live at HFES. Oh, man, it's a little different this week. I will admit I don't have my whole podcasting set up, and we're doing this a little, uh, you know, uh, a little, uh, you know, it works, and, and we'll get through the stories this week. So uh, how are you, man? How How is life on... Uh, the west coast man life is good just hanging out doing the same old same old actually i've got a little follow-up banter from you from a few weeks ago um about sure, For- sure. yeah because you brought up that you had played Fortnite and there was some some really difficult mechanics or there was just a lot of them going on at once right there's a there's a lot of pieces that <laughs> yeah there's a lot of moving parts in Fortnite. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So they've released uh, kind of like a free-to-play version called Fortnite Battle Royale, which is basically 100 people on one map, and you're just duking it out. It's very like... They are they are uh, copying off the success of uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Yes, exactly, yeah. And I, I hopped in it not really knowing what to expect for sure, but it was free. So it was one of those things, why not to get in there and just hop in? But I just yeah, wanted to yeah. echo your sentiments for sure. I had a really tough time like figuring out all the building mechanics um, how and how that all plays in. And then they've also integrated some kind of eye of the storm part, which I understand the purpose of it for sure. Um, but anyway... It was just a very, it was a cool experience. It was awesome to be on a map with a hundred people and that they had like obviously thought about it in ways to try and gather people up and make sure that games don't go on for days. And it was really quick to play, but definitely I have to agree. The mechanics were just really, really tough. And I got to say, man, if you're only playing the battle Royale, you're only playing half the game. And that is even, even just hearing you talk about how you think that there's system bloat, even in only half of a game, that is saying something. There are so many, yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot of mechanics going on with that game that, that really, um, uh, makes it feel clunky to play, but, uh, just but yeah, one of those. So Nick, come on, man, tell me what's going on with you. I'm excited to hear. Well, okay. So obviously the big news, we are here in Austin, Texas, our worst trailer dropped. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> okay obviously that's not the big news the big news is that we're here at hfes um people want my thoughts on the star wars trailer i like it go watch it all right uh i me at hfes i'll, I'll talk your uh, your ear off about it but okay so yes i am here at hfes the gala was tonight and it went well um i actually met up with a cu- uh, couple of listeners so shout out to let's see i have them here uh logan and we got Preston and Christy and John. So thank you guys for coming up and talking to me. Uh, we really appreciate it. We love it when you guys engage with us and let us know that people are listening and it is worth our time. Um, in addition to that, we are going to be having a couple bonus episodes this week. Uh, and it looks like looks like no promises here, but we may have guests on the show. With that said... We'll see how it goes, but uh, we are we are going to give you at least one bonus episode, at least one. We're going to shoot for every night, but we're gonna we're gonna have at least one, um, and we're gonna kind of break down all the stuff that we saw here at HFES. We're gonna look at uh, some of the the posters and presentations that we saw, and kind of break down and kind of bite into it. Last year we did a uh, 
uh, recap episode that was it, it, we had so much to talk about and and this this time I kind of want to just do the individual episodes so that way we can take them piecemeal and really dig into them because that was one thing I wish we would have done last year. Yeah, because I remember last year, me and Billy were so stoked to hear you talking about everything, but there was so much that you had seen in so many talks, people that you had met, that it was hard to cram it into like even a 50-minute show. So I'm excited for this year's format for HFES. I'm glad that you think we might have some guests, and awesome that you got to meet some of the people that actually listen to the show. That's just too cool. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and if you are listening, I, I encourage you to come stop and talk to me. Again, I'll be... Uh, I'll be chairing the virtual environments one session on Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. So please feel free to come meet me there and talk to me afterwards. Uh, I'll be there. Happy to happy to talk. But uh, this is our normal episode. So should we go ahead and get into the Human Factors news? Oh, you know, I'm ready for the news. All right. Well, this is to, to let our listeners know, because we are giving the bonus episodes this week, it's going to be a little shorter this week, uh, short but sweet. Uh, we won't do any of the community outreach because, man, I did enough of that tonight. But OK, let's get into the human factors news. This could be any from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence, whatever it is, as long as it has to do with the field of human factors. It is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week, buddy? All right. So it's predicted by around 2020, we're going to see over 50 billion connected Internet of Things devices being deployed. But the big problem is how can that amount of devices be connected at such a large scale? Because it's 50 billion. When hundreds of devices are being deployed, it could take months or even years to do it manually, connecting all these moving parts by human hand. Well, the chipmaker Intel has developed a software development kit called the Intel Secure Device Solution to help companies provision their Internet of Things devices in a secure and automated way. And did I mention that this entire product is being given away for free? You say? Sorry, Nick, you dropped a little bit there. I said for free, you say. Yeah, that's, I couldn't even believe that reading the article. But I guess it makes sense because Intel's whole goal here, for those of you who haven't seen the article, is they're just really trying to push along people not getting away from just the concept designs of Internet of Things devices, but actual deployment. And I think this is a great way to get them in more industrial settings or inside not just homes, but like real companies. Yeah, and this is so this kind of dovetails nicely with what I was talking about last week. I think I actually brought up this need, and I was thinking of it more on a uh, household uh, basis where you would have some sort of service that would set up all of your internet things for you. And this is taking it to the macro level where you have entire companies and corporations incorporating this across their entire organization. And uh, that to me is pretty impressive. That just that took the scope that I was thinking of and one-upped it well yeah and it makes sense and i think what's kind of just blowing my mind here is this is just basically an sdk that you of course have to get buy-in from different vendors and companies and get them into the product but it's being being given for free and is now taking this potential months or years of human time and cutting it down into maybe a week of automated connection time. So that's, I don't know. I feel like, well, the more these kinds of technologies come out that'll help internet of things, devices being connected at scale, uh, just the more we're going to see it. And I think it's just going to change the ecosystem of how we experience, you know, manufactured products. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, it, I, I keep going back to my comments last week. The, the problem with the internet of things stuff as it is now is that it's so, difficult to set up all these things, right? I mean, you have to set parameters for every device, every device, but if you had some sort of macro level setup that you can just uh, deploy at, you know, a one button or uh, in terms of some sort of macro um, uh, process driven deployment, then that, that would solve a lot of the problems that we face with the internet of things stuff. Yeah, for sure. The one thing that I found a little confusing in this article, I mean, they talk about some of the barriers to getting this done, right? Which makes sense from you got you have to get buy-in from your device manufacturer, also the people who are making the platforms that may be running on these devices. So that makes sense. That's typical stakeholder buy-in for a product. But one thing they talk about or they mention in a line is that they actually have to worry about getting the 
silicone level the machines for provisioning these devices put together. So it sounds like it's not just the single SDK being the solution, but also like putting bots in the place that'll actually make it so these devices can be physically connected in cases where it's needed. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So a lot of times, uh, wow. Okay, I had a couple drinks at the gala, folks. Uh, a lot of times they just do it through Wi-Fi, and, and the point here is that there is this physical infrastructure that needs to be uh, established as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean that makes that makes a lot of sense, especially in this case, because uh, it's not like you can just in a lot of times just stick it somewhere and it'll connect. I mean, there's got to be some kind of manual interaction. Yeah, I agree. All right. Do you have any other thoughts on this? We move bots. Uh, let's let's move into chat bots, man. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. So Microsoft's HoloLens is a device that looks similar to a VR headset, but its focus is definitely on augmented or mixed reality, adding virtual objects to the to your actual surroundings. And soon, conversational chatbots won't just live in phones and computers, but it sit but assist industrial workers from within their actual HoloLenses. So using chatbots in the industry, workers are already able to up the necessary details, visualize information, and follow procedures without a lot of extensive training. But this tech is not just limited to industrial setting. There's also implications for construction, e-commerce, and even use in healthcare. Now, this was pretty cool to see because I haven't really heard about the HoloLens in a while. And I thought it was great that they've obviously taken kind of the lessons from Google Glass and stepped into a more industrial setting with this like HoloLens headset, but now that they've got basically conversational chatbots that are acting as kind of running applications for you, that's just so cool. Because I, I don't know about you, Nick, but I, I remember seeing a lot in the news or in the designer news about designing chatbots and building chatbots, and I didn't really see the connection of where all it was going to go and how it was going to work outside of like a customer service deal. And this is a perfect example. Yeah, so this this marries two ideas that I love. Uh, you have both the augmented reality or, or mixed reality, and you also have uh, artificial intelligence. And I just the the implications of this to me, uh, what this means is that the Hololens can look at an object, interpret what that object is, and you can then ask a question about this object and have the Hololens talk to you about an object in your environment or, um, you know, a series of processes in your environment and then basically coach you through it or answer any questions you have about the process. And, uh, man, it's like, it's like tech support, uh, built into your AR heads. Yeah, exactly. Nick. I mean, it is, it's like tech support on steroids and it's, it's that awesome concept that I don't know. I've always felt like I've seen in movies, it's it's I'm going to make it analogous to a Matrix reference. It's not exactly the same, but it's almost like being able to plug into something and learn all the moves. Well, in this case, you have a chat bot that allows you to put overlays on your over what you're looking at and give you hints about what you should be doing or the procedures to go through. And it, it's crazy the examples that they brought in, too, because they've got everything from identifying if steel beams on a construction site are the wrong size uh, to actually showing you showing a surgeon an outline of the spine and all the nerves while he's actually performing surgery i mean there's just so many implications of this technology it's crazy yeah i was actually doing a lot of preliminary research for a project that had a lot of these threads obviously i can't talk much about it but um uh, I was doing a lot of research for this and it's it's nice to see that this is hitting mainstream where um you know, at least the uh, using the Hololens in the environment to and help uh, the users learn what it is they need to be doing in specific contexts. And uh, it's nice to see that they're adding the chatbot functionality. The big thing to me is the chatbot, right? I mean, this is <clears throat> this is basically uh, a, a, a further another way to manipulate your environment or overlay your environment with additional information feeds and the chat bot sure but that chat bot can if it, if it has eyes on your environment it can use ai to determine what these objects are and 
Ah, I love it. I love this. Yeah, and it's it's like a step above what we can do with like things like Siri or any of the other personal virtual assistants out there because it's not just going and getting you information or telling you things or doing kind of smaller tasks that you can have it automate for you on your phone. It's actually showing you in your environment like, okay, this is what you asked me for. Here's how it fits into what you're actually seeing in your field of view. And even here's how you could manipulate it to make the changes you want. Yeah. Yeah, it's ah, I love it. So cool. <laughs> All right, I'm sure that I'm sure the audience will be making fun of us for saying how much we love it, but this is such a cool like application of chatbots and into the hollow lens and I feel like this is this at some point is going to be inside of glasses, not like hollow lens headset. I don't think that's too far in the future. But anyway, well, yeah, I mean, it, it'll definitely be interesting to see where the technology goes. And I feel like I end a lot of our stories with that. But seriously, I mean, that's why we do this show. We do this to get in early to the left of all these things that are coming out. And how are we going to interact with these things in the future? And so it's important to start thinking about these things early. And I keep saying these things. It's important to bubble concepts that are coming uh, to our everyday lives. And how are we going to adjust to uh, accommodate those. Um, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before we move on? Uh, no, I mean, I just, I can't believe the scope of what this thing can be used for. So I just think the technology is awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm blown away. All right. Uh, for a tech crunch, the next web. Oh, just those two this week for all of our stories. And if you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media for links to our original articles. And uh, I want to thank all of our Slack members for hanging out and uh, commenting on some of these threads with us. Um, and you can you can go join our Slack too. You can uh, it's in the show description and it's also on our website and on our SoundCloud. Go check it out. Hang out with us. We have uh, we're starting to get other. Uh, some of the uh, older recurring hosts that come in from time to time and as well. So if you have any specific questions about their specialties, you can you can hang out with them there. Okay, Blake, so what do we got up next? Well, funny enough, since you mentioned the Slack, this actually was kind of probed by one of our listeners, but also somebody that joined our Slack. I, th- I think his name is Andreas. So thanks, Andreas, for suggesting this. This was a, a cool follow-up, especially since last week we talked about Amazon. But anyway... So we've got some yeah. Google devices that dropped last week, and they were all, again, really centered around these connected devices in the home, such as your Google Home, additional fo- voice control features for this, and even a pair of headphones that act as your own personal babblefish. So, Nick, I figured we could just break down a few of the devices, kind of maybe their implications, similar to what we did last week with Amazon. Yeah, I feel like we can just jump into these one by one and kind of talk about the implications of them. And like you said, so initially, I wasn't even going to post this article. I felt it was too close to Amazon that we posted last week. But then Andreas posted it in our Slack, and I, I really sat and thought about it and said, wow, okay, there's there's some novel stuff here, and there is some things that are going to change how we interact with uh, the technology in our lives. Like. Let's okay. So let's just break them down. Okay, first off, we have the Google Mini Large uh, Home, which is just a smaller and larger vi- version of the Google Home. Um, it's got a broadcast feature that makes these housewide announcements. It's kind of like Alexa. Honestly, it's effectively the same thing as Alexa. The only the only advantage I see is that it has access to Google. I am I don't I don't have a preference either way. Um, I'm not sure. Sound like. Uh, you know, Google not original here, but this is, I, I kind of just want to get through this because really the juicy bits are at the very end. Do you agree? Yeah, hundred percent, man. So yeah, that, all I mean, right. basically all there is to the home is like Nick said, there's a broadcast feature and then hands free calling. But other than that, not a whole lot of crazy changes. Agree. All right. So then next up we have the nest, which uh, they have um, built in Google home integration, right? You have voice triggered mechanism. Uh, for Chromecast and Nest Cams. Um, so they're doing that. They got AR stickers, which is whatever. Uh, <laughs> Daydream VR, which, good. They get a larger uh, field of view. Great. Okay, let's dig into these two things. I'm going to save the Pixel Buds for last, but let's get into Google Clips first. 
Okay, let's let's talk about it because if you think there's a lot here, I want to know why. Because I found myself asking, "What in the world is this?" Yeah, I see that. I see. I see your little note on the show notes that, you know, that say why. <laughs> well, so, okay, so tell the listeners what it is, and maybe I can uh, explain myself. You still there, Nick? Sorry, Blake, I lost you for. Yeah, I lost you for a sec. What was that? Oh, it's all good. So I figured we could just tell listeners what Google Clips is first, and then I'll maybe try and explain why I left that note in the notes. Yeah, I think that sounds. All right. Camera. Oh, there we go. He's back. Oh, there we go. Austin's internet, everyone. Thank you, JW Marriott, for this wonderful internet. Uh, Here we go. So (laughs) the uh, Google Clips, basically, is a camera that clips onto you. So... um, you got like a shirt on a, a bike on the table, wherever you want to put this thing. And it, um, it basically uses AI to automatically take shots for you. So if you are and facial recognition, so if you are in the presence of your friends or whatever, it will detect that and it will take good candid photos of you guys, um, just on the fly for having it around. All right. I got to say, I just I don't see the true utility in that for some reason or another. I mean, it's it's awesome that there's machine learning powerful enough that can like be detecting faces and take and I take a bunch of shots. But I just don't see what this really brings to the table. So I think what this brings to the table is the fact that you have this piece of technology in your life that is always watching you. It is now like having an always listening device, but now it's an always watching device, right? And the fact that it can it can understand, it can use AI to take potentially the best photos of you you've ever had. Um, I mean, we are a society that likes to share experiences, and we do that through social media. And I feel that this is going to change the way we share those stories across social media. Because now, instead of having... Um, you know, these staged photos, you can actually remember things like our memory is malleable. We do not retain things the way it actually happened. Um, Any psychologist can tell you that, right? So the fact that this will take pictures as they actually, you may misremember them, but they will be much more accurate to what actually happened rather than, oh, hey, look, I went to Not Scary Farm and we all took a picture together and it was staged. And it was a thing. I completely forgot about that experience because, uh, you know, we didn't have the camera ready. Yeah, totally. I mean, it could. I could see how it would, um, I guess, really caption a lot more action and maybe catch some memories that you would forget later on. Um, and it's just one of those things, like, if you put it on and tried it out, maybe I'd have a different opinion of it. It just seemed like a kind of amongst all this connected technology, I mean, aside from the AR stickers, uh, it just seemed like an odd thing, but I, I agree with you. People really like to share all their experiences. And what if you could have something that was always rolling uh, and you didn't have to have somebody who was good at taking pictures with their phone. Um, so right. yeah, that's, I mean, I see, that, I see your point. That's the big one for me. I'm terrible at taking pictures and I'm always constantly being reminded and prompted to take pictures um, because I'm, I'm very much one that likes to just sit and enjoy the experience. But uh, you know, other forces that be remind me to take out my phone and take pictures. But with that being said, I don't feel like I fully converted you and that's okay. I'm kind of playing devil's advocate for this here because I feel like if I got this and put it on, it would be like, Oh, look, there's like seven hours of footage of me playing video games on the couch. And remember that one time when, I uh, I got up for <laughs> some water. <laughs> oh, man, that was a good time. But I mean, like, you know, to wear it out to events or something, it might be a little weird to have a camera on you that just kind of records. It's also that whole concept of Big Brother, right, that we're going to have to get used to. Um, it's just more in your face, I think, with this. So I don't know. I'm... I'm not entirely sold on the idea either, but I I felt like it was worth talking about because it is something that is a complete 180 from how we do things now. Oh, surely. And I think probably part of my like 
angst against it, I guess, is because I love taking pictures. I mean, that's something I love doing is doing composition of photography, taking pictures of of events, going out and shooting a video with my camera. So it's it's something that I love to do. So I, of course, have a hard time thinking like having some other piece of machinery do it for you. But I have to admit there is beauty in the fact that this could be capturing like a lot of actiony things. Say you're like with your family or out with your girlfriend, and you guys are having a good time and just by the fact that there's a little bit of AI put in this camera that has good facial recognition skills, you could capture an entire day together and it would, it would be, you could share on social media, you could send it to your friends. So there's definitely utility in it. And I'm glad to get your perspective. Cause when I saw it just kind of like, you know, clipped onto the flower bag, I was very confused about why there was a camera on the flower bag clip. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we'll have to see. I, I'd be interested in picking one of these things up and testing it, but who knows? Okay, this is the real meat and potatoes of this Google story, though. You ready for the Pixel Buds? Oh, my goodness. This is so cool. These are amazing. So these basically, basically these are headphones. These are headphones, but what they do is if you're in a foreign country and where you know, people are speaking a language that you don't understand. It will basically take that language and translate it in real time in your ears. So it is like you are hearing the language of the natives. And that is so cool. That just seems so unreal to me. I mean, cause there's, there's definitely like, we and we'll talk about this in a few stories. I think about like how sci-fi kind of influences technology. And I know that the first time I've ever seen this, is like either in Hitchhiker's Guide or some other sci-fi film. And I, for some reason, I wondered if it would ever be possible. But I guess with things like the algorithm that sits behind Google Translate and figuring out how to stick it into basically earbuds is just, it's kind of incredible that it's come this far this quickly. You know, this is, so this is the most exciting thing to me because I think this is going to change the way that we interact with going to change the way that we interact with uh, everything. Like communication is no longer hindered by what language you speak. You can learn one language and be able to speak or be able to understand anyone who you want to interface with. The obviously, what does that mean for the future of learning languages? Are you going to never, are you going to stop learning multiple languages now because you can just speak one and have it translate? Um, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think there's still utility in being able to speak multiple languages to convey your ideas. Um, but still it, it, it is one of those things where it's just like, I can't want to have these pixel buds and I want to just jump into the most foreign country I can think of with a language I know. Sorry, Nick, it looks like you dropped off there a little bit, but I definitely can echo your sentiments. Yeah, yeah. I I just want to, if I can survive with these things. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when, when I saw it and, um, and then I saw like you and Andreas talking about it in our Slack. I went and took a took a peek at them, and it, honestly, I really wanted to just buy two pairs of them and take them any time that I go and travel to different countries, so that you could converse with somebody and they could understand you too. In case it's like a non predominant English speaking country, right. or, or something like that, because it's uh, like that's the biggest barrier to entry now, which is not that crazy if people are carrying around two sets or if this becomes like a ubiquitous thing. Um, I don't know this, this kind of step is, uh, is awesome to see from Google. Cause I won't lie. I was kind of like, yeah, okay, great. They added more, more features to their like Google home and already existing products and Google clips is cool. I mean, that's, it's obviously an awesome algorithm behind a camera and I'm a sucker for cameras, but this really blew me away and I haven't seen something come out that was just seemed like a big time transformative technology like this in a long time. Yeah, this yeah, this was the big story, and I'm glad uh, I'm glad we got pointed in the direction of this because like I was just I I was meh about it until I saw that and and started talking about it and yeah it's it's exciting. All right, uh, let's get through these next couple stories here. All right, so what do we got up next? All right, this one is again trip down sci-fi lane for me. So typically when you're taking care of a cut or a scrape, that usually means you're swabbing, swapping out bandages a few times and making, 
maybe putting a little healing cream or hydrogel on there. But what if the dressing or bandage could dispense that stuff on its own? Well, of course, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Harvard, and MIT are pushing the envelope in this regard, testing a new smart bandage. And the bandage can release doses of medication like uh, hydrocil onto wounds through a few taps of a smartphone app. Man, leave it to those big name schools to bring just some awesome technology into the world of Band-Aids. I know. Yeah. Uh, th- so the reason this is human factors is because it's so easy, right? This is changing the way that we uh, heal ourselves. This is how uh, it's changing the way we uh, self-medicate and how we take care of ourselves when we get injured. and i mean it's there's a lot of tech in this little band-aid right i mean because we're talking i mean this is this comes directly from the article it's it's basically made up of composite fibers with a core electrical heater and it's covered by a layer of hydrogel containing this thermal responsive drug carrier right now that's a lot of different things that could potentially if you've got you're walking around with a small electrical heater plastered to your skin a lot of stuff could go wrong if it's not tested correctly in the right environments with different types of people across like different applications so i mean there's just a lot of human factors even from the tested evaluation side of things uh when it comes yeah. to this yeah you're absolutely right on that one um so what what's up next for these uh the, they're trying to by uh, the fda they're looking to integrate uh, new sensors in with these fibers to measure blood, glucose levels. They're basically expanding its functionality and capability. Yeah, it's it's almost like they're going to at some point just have, this is a bad analogy, but I'm going to make it anyway, like Nicorette patches that will act as your entire all-in-one Fitbit at all times. Because, I mean, we're talking about now measuring blood glucose, pH, all things that you were talking about. Plus, in this case, maybe even healing wounds at the same time. Uh, so I don't know wearable technology just gets cooler and cooler. I agree, and I I, I love this little bit here at the very end uh, that suggests that maybe someday we'll have a progress bar on our bandage that tells us how healed we are. I love that idea. I think that's awesome because I don't know. Honestly, I'm pretty bad about putting band-aids on things and all that kind of stuff, but I feel like if I knew how long I had to wear it and was able to see progress over time, I'd be more inclined to take care of cuts and scrapes like that. Sci-fi. Because it's like, do you see what I'm doing? I'm setting us up for the next story. That to me is just pure sci-fi because it's like uh, it's like a system status of your body. It is. It's exactly that. Sci-fi. Sorry, Nick, you're cutting out a little bit again. Oh, I just said, speaking of sci-fi, <laughs> let's move on to the next one. Okay. Yes, indeed. Speaking of sci-fi, so one of the cool things amongst the plethora of things that are cool about sci-fi is that it actually acts like a bit of a demo for technology that hasn't even been invented yet. In that way, it's a bit like UI design and an and an idea about how a product will function that needs to be developed by someone with knowledge of both coding and potentially hyperspace. So in 2017, it's shaping up that is as something of a tipping point with regard to UX as users push back against feature-loaded interfaces. The current feature load is actually super reminiscent of the 80s when visions of the future usually came overloaded with visual indicators. So... Just to, just to take a blast from the past, let's look back at some sci-fi classics and see what would have delighted and what would have sent a user going down a navigational black hole. So definitely, I, I don't know if uh, I've talked about this on the show before, there's a book that is a lot about this, more so geared towards what we can learn from sci-fi in terms of UI design and user experience. Um, it's called Make It So, but a lot of these pointed out here are actually some of like the instances that they talk about where it's like s- system overload status in terms of how much information it's trying to push in. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, let's break these down. So first one is Star Wars. Uh, I'd be more than happy to talk about this one. Um, so the uh, <laughs> the whole Death Star wireframe plans, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems it seems clean and straightforward. Uh, it's a visualization of what's going to shoot the dotted line into the tunnel opening and then watch it travel down to the center of the circle and boom. Okay, good. 
the single color simplified visualization. It's uh, clean, much uh, much more sense than some movies you eyes where they add things to look more real, right? Um, the uh, brightness contrast is good. Thick line size would probably pass the AAA uh, level to uh, um, for web accessibility guidelines. It, it sounds like it's 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 good and it's acceptable, right? Yeah, I mean, from <laughs> for standards that we like apply today, I mean, it's it'll work. That's for sure. And it's not so much overload. It's very, it's right, like you said, relatively simple and straight to the point. So this is funny because we actually had the Star Wars podcast a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away where we actually broke down human cyborg relations, where we actually kind of talked about uh, um, human factor stuff in the Star Wars universe and, and it didn't really work out. But this is this is a point that we actually made in that in that show was uh, how the um, <clears throat> the interface in Luke's X-Wing is horribly overdesigned and it it's got a lot of sci-fi looking things that really don't do a whole lot of stuff and what could it possibly do if it was a real interface right yeah exactly and i mean that was kind of fun to do right because we're looking at cinema photography and things that are purposely over designed just to look intricate and super in the future which in reality is very ironic since i mean as the like opener says in 2017, we're really trying to pull back the amount of features that are in products and go for a much more minimalist look. So the future is shaping up to be a little more uh, feature, like a smaller set of features versus like an overload that we see a lot of these examples. Sure. Sure. There are a couple movies in this list, but let's just jump down to uh, Jurassic park just because of time. And then, uh, and then we'll move on. Uh, you want to take Jurassic Park? Oh yeah. So this <laughs> this particular one was hilarious to me because it it definitely was reminiscent of old Unix systems, and that's something I just have not seen in so long. Um, but basically, so it's just one of those where the designer's trying to get the user's head around the cloud. So just going around trying to show the controls of Jurassic Park. And it's just basically a giant hall of boxes. So, I, <laughs> oh, I apologize, guys. Seems like there's a bit of a siren going on. But anyway, uh-oh. Uh, so, it, so this is one of those UIs where you just really don't know if you need all of these boxes to depict a three-dimensional world like it's actually doing. Um, and overall, it's really just, um, sorry, lost lost my train of thought there. Uh, so there's really not a whole lot of good guidance on the screen at all. Uh, and the navigation for this particular UI is just very difficult for anybody to use that potentially did not design it, right? Uh, it's just that age-old problem of sci-fi trying to make things a little more intricate than they actually need to be. Yeah, I agree. This is definitely an interesting article, definitely an interesting read. If you are a sci-fi fan uh, and also someone who likes to pick apart UIs. Um, but, uh, you know, oh, we got said it's a little bit shorter of an episode tonight only because I'm here at HFES and I am starting to crash. <laughs> it has been a crazy – it will be a week. And, uh, uh, if you guys are out here, let me know. Uh, come hang out and stuff, but we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and close it today. Go ahead and hit that music, Blake. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. Uh, you can join us over in our Slack and suggest any uh, suggestions or topics or news stories you want us to cover. Um, we're on social media as well. You can follow us on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can always join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail dot com. If you're feeling saucy, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing and want to support us financially, uh, you can support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast or directory is, uh, you know, and make those things good. And please let all of your friends know about Human Factors Cast. That's the only way that we grow and uh you know, are respected within the community. And of course, if you want to reach us on our home on the web, that's humanfactorscast.com. 
Mr. Blake Arnstorff, thank you so much for helping me break down all these stories today, even though I'm losing my mind over here in Austin. Where can our listeners find you if they want to hang out with you? Oh, you guys can always find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. And thanks, Nick, for breaking the HFES down with us. We're really stoked to have it this week. It's okay. Well, uh, stay tuned for tomorrow uh, because we're bonus episode. It's going to be totally worth it. We're going to go over everything we did this week. And as for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends. Oh, man, it depends. Oh, wow, I'm so tired, Blake. <laughs>